views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access Fort Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at Patty Hunter of Patty's Page, and today my guest is Constance Cumby. She's an author as well as a lawyer, and she was the one that got me out of the New Age movement. I'd like to introduce to you Constance Cumby. Welcome to my show. Well, oh, thank you. Very nice to be here. Thank <laughs> you. We have a lot to talk about today, so uh, hang on to your seats, and this is going to be a very interesting half hour, maybe another show later on. So um, what we're going to begin with is uh, what brought me to her in the beginning when I first met her 23 years ago. And this was about when I was in the New Age movement before I became Christian. Um, because of Connie, if it wasn't for her, I'd still be in the occult and um, I would be lost. And to me, that would have been the worst thing for me. So Connie. Tell me, when you first saw me, what did you think when you found out that I was in the New Age movement? Well, you had some very wonderful friends who brought you into me, and they were quite concerned about you. And uh, we talked, and of course I had talked before you had, you were typical of many people in the New Age movement. You appeared to be searching, confused, in somewhat of an altered state, which is the method methodology. And you... Um, I had fears, which many people do. They're working through fears. And I remember one fear you expressed to me was that you didn't, weren't married yet, didn't have a husband. And I remember telling you, God will find you a husband. I think about a year and a half later, God found you a very wonderful husband. Yes, and I got married. We've been, we've been married now for about uh, 20 years, come April 27, about mm -hmm. last month. And yeah, we, I've been uh, a Christian ever since for 23 years mm -hmm. now. So because of you, uh, if I hadn't have listened to you, I don't know where I would have been right now. I wouldn't know how to met God. I've heard that from many people who came out from the New Age movement. I've seen tremendous courage from many people who exited the New Age movement. It was tough. And that's what gave me the courage to keep on going myself because my work has not been without controversy over the years. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, I know. Um, you've been through a lot um, as you were going through this journey of helping people get out of the movement. Yeah. Um, uh, for those who do not know what uh, the New Age movement is, it's like an umbrella of different types of uh, occult and cults put together. It's a uh, <coughs> what's a what? well, if I could interject a yeah. point. It's a worldwide network of organizations and individuals that were dedicated to three overarching goals: new world order, new world religion, and a new age Messiah. And there, there was the shared expectancy on the three levels. Now, some of the terminology has been modified or changed recently. Yeah. And these days, many participants are calling it global civil society rather than new age movement because oh. they feel the term new age movement has been marginalized. And instead of new world religion, many adherents and scholars that are trying to justify it are calling it public theology. So it changes hats and it changes, it takes on new forms from time to time, or as they would probably put it, it evolves. You know, um, I first started in the New Age movement in the late 70s, early 80s, 1980s, and, and I was deeply into it. Edgar Cayce and 
sci uh, what do you call it? Uh, Scientology. Scientology and Baha'i and um, yoga and all that sort. And um, I was getting deeper and deeper in it. I was seeing um, a guru's uh, disciple, uh, Bhagwan Rasnis. I was seeing him for about two years, getting my life, my past lives uh, healed, so to speak. And um, it was like getting a high, going to be put under hypnosis to, quote, look at my past lives to heal me. And then I'll be fine for about a month after that hypnotic uh, experience with it. And um, then I would crash, literally, spiritually crash, and I would have to get another reading uh, to get me back up there again. Right. Um, it didn't uh, really dawn on me till much later that uh, I, w I live once, I die once, and then I go to either heaven or hell, depending on whether I believe in God or not. Jesus, the real Jesus. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was spooky. Right. I, I stumbled onto the New Age movement very accidentally, not knowing what I was looking at back in 1981. And I suspected something was going on, but uh, I... I had a background. I grew up here in Fort Wayne, Indiana, by the way. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, I uh, then had a career in Michigan, a political career, and then I went to law school and became an attorney in 1975. And all these years I was blissfully unaware of the existence of the New Age movement. Right. But I did have political background and political skills. And in 1981, after my husband had had a terrible, terrible accident in 1979, he lost his legs. They, um, I uh, was casting about for materials that would help me make it from day to day. Yeah. And there was a Methodist bookstore across the street from my downtown Detroit law office. And I would go in there and just pick things off the shelf that would give me comfort, sustenance enough to, encouraging words to make it from one day to the next. And they had lots of very helpful books on the shelf, and the personnel were very nice. And But then I started noticing another line of books in the same store, and I looked at these things rather critically, and I thought, I've not been a saint all my adult life, far from it, but I don't remember this stuff from Sunday school. And they were saying we could worship God and call him Shiva, we could worship oh. God and call him Buddha, God's ways weren't our ways. And, uh, and they were making references to, to a new world order and some type of a mysterious transformation that we all had to go through with some type of a holistic worldview that we were living after all on a tiny crowded planet. And our formerly divisive worldviews just wouldn't allow us to live in peace on this crowded planet. And I remember I, I, I had, uh, I had a weird thought going through me at the time. I thought, wouldn't it be convenient for the Antichrist if Christians believed this? And I felt ashamed of myself for thinking it, but I started, I, one day I picked up just five books from that store <coughs> and took them home and analyzed them with the skills I'd picked up, both as a legislative analyst, which I'd been for the Michigan House of Representatives and later the Senate, yeah. and as, a, as an attorney for the last six years. Then, then it was six years, and I was uh, uh, the common elements were. I had books by Presbyterian authors, Catholic authors, uh, Methodists, Mennonite, so on and so forth. And I noticed the books did not sound like the core teachings of their founders or their usual denominational teachings, but these books all sounded very much like each other. Huh? And I remember asking myself, where in the heck are they getting this stuff? And I didn't really put it together until one day I found a book called The Aquarian Conspiracy by Marilyn Ferguson. I read that when I was in the movement. And all the things I found disturbing, she found hopeful. And she said, now the heretics are gaining ground 
Doctrine is losing its authority and knowing is superseding belief. And uh, I, uh, she quoted from something called The Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ. I found that book too in the same Methodist bookstore the next day. Oh, really? Really. Oh, no. And the, anyway, when I, I read through that and the introduction said it was written by the scribe to the messenger. And it was purported to be channeled uh, writings, but it was in very clever King James style terminology, English. It was, if I hadn't known the real Bible, this would have really thrown me. When you say the word channel, some people might not know what that means. Uh, people that basically, there was an, a writer called Ruth Montgomery. She was a reporter. She, in fact, she was from Detroit originally, but she went to Washington, D.C. Yeah. And Ruth Montgomery was working for the uh, newspaper, and she was introduced to the world of the all cult by a woman I think made a good share of my adolescence miserable, Adele Davis, with her ghastly nutritional concoctions. And, but, uh, but Ruth Davis, uh, Ruth Montgomery wrote a book called Strangers Among Us, and it was about how you could get a walk-in. A walk-in? A walk-in. Some Basically, you let your own personality go, exit, and you let another being and essence come in and take over and live its... I met people like that when I was in the New Age movement. They said, oh, I'm a walk-in. I said, what's that? And she would explain it to me, saying, uh, well, my old soul left me. It went back home, and the new soul that came from another dimension, another plane or whatever mm -hmm. you call it, came into my soul, and we're living out, we're living, both my body and, my, and its soul is living out its life here, trying to find out more about this planet. Right. And that's what they, they honestly believe, and that yes. is what their concept of the New Age Christ is all about. It's probably an ordinary person, but like Krishnamurti attempted to do, or they wanted Krishnamurti to do in 1929, you let your own soul exit, and then you let the possessing spirit come in and basically take over. And I've sometimes said this to New Agers and others that were trying to understand it. I said probably nothing that a good old-fashioned exorcist couldn't cure. That's right. That is so true. I had an exorcism done on me right after I saw right. you. Okay. Well, I, f I found those materials and I was, um, I got to chapter 14 of the Aquarian Gospel. Oh, yeah. And it said a mighty master soul was going to come to earth, a light greater than Jesus, to enlighten the way to the throne of perfect man. And I'm, the ramifications of that, especially coming at a time when they were running the Omen on television, the three-part Omen trilogy on television, oh. <laughs> were overwhelming. Oh, no. The Omen being a, a fantasy account of what life would be like for the kid being raised to be the Antichrist and his subsequent career in the other two parts of the trilogy. Well, I had to learn more about it. And Marilyn Ferguson's book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, said that folks that were involved in this uh, tended to be uh, secretive about this under some circumstances and open under other circumstances, that if they ran into people, they, they would pick up on who they were talking to by their subtle buzzwords and subtle, subtle cues and signals. I used to know the terminology in those And days. that they, that the that if they ran into any opposition, then they would quickly clam up because their writings had been, their work had been too easily misunderstood in the past. And I uh, came up during the, uh, became politically active in the late 60s, early 70s, and we had a phrase, where is somebody coming from? Where are they coming from? And I thought, where are they getting this? Where is this coming from? And Marilyn Ferguson's book gave me some clue, but I had to learn more about it than just Marilyn Ferguson told. So I thought, well, two can play this game. So I carried with me night and day The Aquarian Conspiracy by Marilyn Ferguson mm -hmm. and The Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ by Levi. And it took me two days to catch my first one. 
I was in Wayne County Circuit Court on motion call, right? motion day, and I had those two books with me, and the nice young attorney on the other side, young male attorney, very handsome, he came rushing across the room, and he was just beaming, and he said, I see you have the Aquarian Gospel. Um. Well, I will tell you, I made a very bad, tactless mistake. Uh -oh. I told him what I thought of the Aquarian Gospel, right. what I thought of the Aquarian Conspiracy, and frankly, what I thought of the collective intelligence of those buying into it. Uh -oh, and he, he it was, was not it was, uh, wise, no. it was not kind. I don't recommend that approach. No, uh, we make mistakes. And uh, anyway, he quickly, um, he did do the clamming up. Yes. And he said, well, I don't know much about that. His face just fell, utterly fell. And he said, that's my wife's thing. I don't know much about it. But I could tell from the glow on his face when he first approached me that that was his thing, too. Well, I thought, better switch strategies. That was another phrase we had back in those days. They don't use that anymore, do they? So I continued to carry the books with me, but I ran into a candidate for public office, one that I was personally acquainted with for many <coughs> years. Yeah. And he told me he was thinking of running for Detroit Common Council, the nine-member board that governs Detroit along with the mayor. Yeah. And I was politely encouraging to him. I was considered a very capable politician in those days. And, but I frankly, I had my mind on what I was finding because I thought that made everything else look like trivial pursuit. So I said, well, Al, I said, if there is anything I can do to help, please let me know. And I had a call a few days later. He's going to run. And would I, um, they were going to have a coming out party at his house on Sunday night. Now, on Sunday night, the church I belonged to at the time had Sunday night services. And ever since I found that stuff, I wanted to go to the nearest church and just curl up under the nearest altar so I wouldn't get in any more trouble and just stay there until the Lord returned, which some folks would have us think was today, today. the day of the time. <laughs> today is May 21st. Uh, uh, my Bible says no man knows the day nor the hour. And but <laughs> but for, anyway, oh, yeah. I... Uh, I was headed towards church, and all at once I thought, maybe you'd better go to that party. There's likely to be somebody there that knows about this stuff, I'm referring to the Aquarian conspiracy, the Aquarian gospel. If they're not at that party, it's not big enough to worry about. Well, guess because what? Because he was, he was a great guy, but he tended to attract folks and do offbeat things. So... Anyway, I changed course and I went to the party and I went in and it was very hard to chit chat having all of this on my mind. Yeah. And then he introduces his campaign manager, who was a woman he had introduced me to 14 years earlier and that I had ran into under strange circumstances when my husband was being discharged from the hospital. And she said, um, uh, she sat, joined us at the cafeteria in my office building a year before then and said, how are you, Connie? And I said what I said to everybody back in those days, terrible. She said, why do you say that? And I told her about Barry's accident. And she said, Connie, I can come over to the house and heal him for you. Oh, no. Oh, and no. I said, Phyllis, I said, did you hear me? He lost both legs above the knee. She said, it doesn't matter. I can come over and heal him. Well, I looked at Glenn, who was my law clerk, and he looked at me. And miraculously, we both managed to keep straight faces through that meal. And we excused ourselves, and we got on the elevator. And as soon as we got on the elevator, we started howling. And we laughed all the way upstairs. And we got into the office, and we had clients in the lobby. And we laughed so hard in front of them, I almost hyperventilated. Uh -oh. I remember saying, if she comes over to the house and puts those legs back on him. She will make a believer out of me. And it was just funny. And I didn't think anything more about it until she was introduced as the campaign manager. Mm -mm. And then she said she had been a student of the mind sciences for the last 20 years. And when we saw our candidate, we were to visualize him in the councilman's chair 
and through this act of visualization we would gain the cooperation of the higher powers of the universe who would work to bring our vision into manifestation. And I started kind of conking myself on the head and I'm going, mind science. Visualization, those were things that Marilyn Ferguson talked about in the Aquarian Conspiracy. And I thought, I wonder if Phyllis is part of them. In fact, she used to come down here to Fort Wayne for groups on some of her New Age studies. She'd confided to me before she knew where I was coming from that night. Uh -huh. And that was later in the evening. Well, anyway, I made a beeline for her as soon as the party was over, and I said, Phyllis, I heard you mention the mind sciences. And she said, yes. I said, years ago, I read a book by a plastic surgeon named Matthew Maltz called Psycho-Cybernetics. And I've been so interested in the mind sciences since then. Maybe I could take you to dinner, and you can tell me more about it. And she said, sure. Now, I swear to God, I did not know that they had a saying in the movement she was involved in, that when the master, when the pupil is ready, the master will appear. I did not know anything about that. And here, she was not one to shirk her dinner, her duty, especially when a free dinner was attached. So we headed out, and we uh, sat down at a deli, and she was very careful about what she ordered. She'd lost 20 pounds. She looked gorgeous. I'd found them. I didn't look <laughs> as gorgeous. And they, um, anyway, I said, tell me about the mind sciences. And she said, it's part of the New Age movement. That was the first time I'd heard those three words together. Oh. This was 30 years ago. 30 years? 30 years ago. And she said, I don't know if I've heard of it, if you've heard of it or not. And I said, no, at least not by that name. Is it ever called anything else? And she said, yes, it's called the New Consciousness Movement, the Holistic Movement. She gave me a few names. And, she, and then she mentioned Age of Aquarius, and when she said that, I held up my Aquarian gospel. I said, Phyllis, is this by any chance part of it? And she beamed all over. She said, why, yes, it certainly is. Oh and then I said, well, what do you do in this movement? And she said, we communicate with code words and signals. Now, I did not know that, but okay. I did not know that they, she was a student of the Alice Bailey books which said that if you run into somebody who asks you a question about esoteric matters who's been active in progressive causes, and I will tell you, I was a progressive cause joiner back in those days, if anybody ever was. I, everybody knew me in those circles. And she said, that person asks you a question about esoteric matters, you are to assume that they have taken at least one initiation, possibly two, and your duty to take them higher is clear. Well, she, again, she wasn't one to shirk the duty. Uh, I went to Detroit College of Law now, which is part of Michigan State University College of Law, or School of Law, mm -hmm. and we were taught there not to assume anything. But she made an assumption that I was already into it deeply from the questions I had asked. And so I said, what do you do in this movement? She said, we communicate with code words and signals. And I said, I've been studying on my own little while, best I could without a good teacher like you to help me. Again, I didn't know they had that saying about when the pupil is ready, the master will appear. Oh, uh, they thought you were a master? Yeah, no, she thought I was the pupil and she was the master. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it's, I not, said, it's not yeah. funny. It's not funny. Yeah. It's well, she, not. she's, anyway, I said, Ho I, th I think I may know some of the words. And she said, okay. And I said, holistic. She almost fell off her chair. She said, why, yes. Spaceship Earth, yes, paradigm. I, I will confess to you, up until I discovered the New Age movement, I thought paradigm was 20 cents. Right. <laughs> was, <laughs> That's pretty good. And um, any, every word I said, she got a little more excited, and she told me more than I should add to the vocabulary. And then I said, well, communicating's fun and fine, but what are we communicating about? And she said, we believe the mind operates on principles just as one's body operates on principles. And I said, well, that sounds logical to me. Tell me, what are the principles? And she told me a few that I'm sure would register now, but then it sounded like gobbledygook. Yeah. And she said, finally, she said, the most important principle of all is karma. Oh. And I had noticed a strong thread of mysticism running through everything, so I asked her if Eastern religions had anything to do with this. And she said, well, yes, Eastern religions are part of it, but we're much larger than the Eastern religions. 
And I was doing this inward gulp because Marilyn Ferguson's book had already described this immense, immense movement. Mm -hmm. mean and and here world. she's saying, oh, that's nothing. When you say the Eastern religions, you're describing a good share of the world's population. So I, then I told her that um, in my spare time since Barry's accident, I'd become quite the Bible scholar. And I was convinced beyond any reasonable doubt that this was perhaps the movement that had been spoken of that might usher in the Antichrist. Oh. And I thought she'd say, you're crazy. She said, oh yes, that's very perceptive of you. I have been convinced of that for many years myself. And so I, anyway, I had in my stack of books a Bible and I had the Aquarian Gospel. Anybody that knew me knew I always had a stack of books with me. These days I usually have a computer with me or a Kindle. <laughs> yes. And she, she said, um, uh, I turned to Daniel 14, or Daniel 11, 38. He shall honor in his estate the God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew not. And then I opened the Aquarian Gospel to the foreword saying, one may enter fully into the spirit of the God of force. Mm -hmm. And I said, look at this. And she said, you saw it. You saw it. She said, that is such an important principle. Most students of esotericism fail to grasp it immediately. And then she said, also, you must remember that in the New Age movement and at Unity, we believe Jesus and the Christ are two separate entities. Oh. The Christ is an office, not a man. And I just involuntarily quoted to her 1 John 2.22. And all at once she had two mystic crystal revelations. A, I didn't want to run off and join the age of Aquarius, and B, she'd probably told me too much. Mm -hmm. And so and she started trying to take it back. Well, with and that, um, it's going on towards the end of the show. Can you come on again? Sounds like fun. Oh, merciful heavens, I have to have you back on. Okay. Uh, we have about at least a minute or a half, minute, two minutes. So... Um, Thank you, Connie. We are going to talk about what we what we just mentioned, and of course, your book that you had done many moons ago is called "The Hidden Danger of the Rainbow." Well, this was very. Um, I, I I had seen on the internet that it was in the Fort Wayne Public Library, but your husband went and gra and checked it out of the Fort Wayne Public Library, and I used to come down here when I was a girl. And uh, this was my favorite haunt, and I never dreamed that I would see my own book on the shelves, but here it is. Well, we're going to talk yeah. about that right after. So I'd like to thank you for tuning in to my show, Patty's Page. And thank you, Connie Constant, Constance Cumby. Thank you. And um, thank you for coming on and listening to my show, and I'll see you next time. Have a great day.